everyone. Hello and welcome to another episode of Cyberspeak with InfoSec Institute. Today's guest is Dr. Jared DeMott, the CEO and founder of VDA Labs. Jared has made a career out of finding security vulnerabilities and is the author of Fuzzing for Software Security Testing and Quality Assurance. Uh, today we are going to talk about the security risks associated with the Internet of Things, or IoT, and some of the ways that we might make these seemingly peripheral devices safer from unwanted intruders. Dr. Jared DeMott is an information security expert and previously served as a vulnerability analyst with the NSA. He holds a PhD from Michigan State University. He regularly speaks on vulnerabilities at conferences like RSA, DerbyCon, Black Hat, TourCon, GERCon, and HITB and others. He was a finalist in Microsoft's Blue Hat Prize Contest, which helped make Microsoft customers more secure. Dr. DeMott has been on three winning DEF CON Capture the Flag teams and has been an invited lecturer at prestigious institutions such as the United States Military Academy. Jared is also a Pluralsight author and a professor at Dakota State University. Dr. DeMott, thank you for being with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. So um, let's start out by talking a little bit about your security journey. Uh, how did you get involved in security and vulnerability testing in the first place? And um, how do you feel like that industry has changed since you started? Yeah, great question. Um, got into it like many did. Uh, you know, growing up in the early 90s, it wasn't really a thing. It wasn't really a field. So it's not that I knew as an elementary school child that I wanted to be in cyber or anything. It wasn't really a thing. But I knew that I wanted to be in technology. I was kind of the one that always tinkered with the radio control car and kind of a nerd like that. And um, just loved that and actually had planned to go to the Air Force Academy. My parents kind of talked me out of that. They thought I would die in some crazy overseas war or something. And Although I was going to go for aerospace engineering, so I'm not sure how that would have happened. I probably would have ended up behind a desk like I do today. <laughs> right, or out in space or something. Yeah. You know what? It worked out for the best, though, because I ended up going and, and getting a bachelor's degree and then going right to the NSA, which I loved. It um, was a great place to start a career. It was a lot of fun there. And then throughout, I had just kind of, continue to buckle down, just having the, an energy and excitement to learn and grow and work for various other defense contractors and then commercial startup companies out of California and did a PhD, like you said, at Michigan State and kind of got involved in writing and teaching and then decided, you know what, it's time to stretch my own legs and um, try my own hand at VDA Labs, the vulnerability discovery and analysis. Uh, that's the business that I run and we have a lot of fun. We get to find bugs and help customers. When was VDA Labs founded? So I actually founded it a long time ago. Um, I guess I'll have to look at my LinkedIn. I don't remember the exact year. But it wasn't until about three years ago that I sort of quit my day job and you know kind of took the big leap. It's really scary, right? You're going to hire sure. staff. And you're going to pay the benefits. And that whole process of finding customers and developing a, you know, a pipeline you know, so all my training was in the technology side, right? My, my PhD, for example, is in computer science. So I never went to business school and that type of stuff. So I had to learn all that on my own, which was not really that hard. Um, it just took time to develop, you know, that sort of network and, and all that to do that. And, and really, it's been great. I actually love doing that. I love meeting with customers and kind of doing that part of it now as well. So good stuff. Yeah. Um, what, what is, tell me a little bit about VDA, VDA Labs and your mission and sort of methods and your day-to-day -day operations? What, what, what sort of things do you do for your clients? Yeah, sure. So we're a full spectrum cyber company, right? So anything from code auditing, pen testing, incident response, training, application security, AppSec training, malware training, um, red teaming, blue team engineering, you name it, we'll basically take on any, any cool you know, project that, you're, that you would like us to help you with in the cyber space. And we're, we're really passionate about that. Our approach is kind of more of the, you know, bring a senior team of folks. Uh, we've had too many experiences where we talk to customers and they're like, yeah, we had a pen test from a you know, big, well-known company I won't mention, and it was basically just an SS report or something, and, and there wasn't much there for findings. And that's too bad because we always find really good stuff and have a lot of fun doing that. So I guess I'm just excited about uh, helping people out in that way. How, um, how did you come to write uh, or, or co-author uh, the, the book on fuzzing? Um, how did that sort of become like an area of, of specialty that you found especially interesting? Uh, well, the good, good, good question. That was probably, I want to say, somewhere around the 2005 time frame. Fuzzing was just uh, becoming a thing. Most companies weren't really doing it. It was mostly just the bad guys basically doing it, finding bombs. And, you know, this was the time when all the bombs were still in the server. So think of like IIS and FTP and 
you could basically just pop a box on the internet and you would be into somebody's DMZ and then you would kind of hack from the outside in. It, it, it was sort of before the time of client side exploits and you know sending sending phishing emails and ma macros and Word documents. It was kind of before all that, really. And so I was into that and I had published a tool called GPF, the General Purpose Fuzzer. And uh, a gentleman out of Finland, actually, Ari Tikkanen, reached out to me and said, hey, you're into fuzzing. We here at the University of Hulu, we do a lot of fuzzing too. Um, he later founded or helped co-found a company called Codenomicon and it got picked up by Synopsys and has become part of their commercial tool set offering. So anyway, long story short, I met him. Um, he actually came to Michigan where I was living at the time and stopped by you know, the, the little town I live in, which was really fun. Uh, there was some wild blackberries growing nearby and I kind of showed him, hey, look, you can just pick and eat these. He's like, oh, that's crazy. You can do that here. Uh, but anyway, uh, just random stories. And then we, we involved Charlie Miller as well, who's well known in the field and you know, asked him to write a portion of the book as well. And I guess the rest is history. It's just kind of one of those books that, uh, you know, it's kind of fun. That, that we have a lot of personal memories. It's on the shelf. And, um, yeah, there's lots of good, good information as far as, you know, finding bugs in software. You can probably Google and find a lot of that info, too, you know, or the YouTube or just finding data and stuff like that. But it's just neat to have gone down those roads and have those experience of authoring books. So, yeah, thanks for asking about that. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's a very good sort of, snapshot of, of where security was at the moment. And I mean, I, I imagine some of that stuff is, you know, with, with technology changing and stuff, it's maybe not as relevant anymore, but you know, it, it's, you know, you get that sort of continuum of, like, or, or, or is fuzzing still sort of a. Yeah. I mean, so with written material, I feel like that is a challenge in security. Like by the time right. you publish a book three years later, after you started writing it, it's sort of, but we actually did do a second edition update that oh, covered yes. like they have on some of the more recent open source fuzzing tools that are out there and things. So, yeah, it's it's um, it's worth reading. So um, we brought you here today to talk about uh, sort of the current status of the Internet of Things or IoT. Uh, you know, which for those of us who are watching this video and not really sure what that is, it's uh, basically any sort of device that has some degree of internet connectivity, right? Uh, especially things that don't normally have them. I mean, when I when I hear IoT, I think of things like like cars with, you know, internet or, you know, the, you know, the, the old one was always, oh, your coffee pot's going to have the internet in it and stuff like that. So what, what, what is your sort of like formal definition for internet, IoT enabled devices, I guess? Um, you know what? It's kind of taken on a pretty broad definition these days. I think it could almost be considered anything that's not a traditional laptop, you know, desktop, server. Right. Also, it's generally not considered mobile. Um, there's usually other definitions for, you know, sort of SCADA, ICS, industrial equipment and automotive as well, but really in many ways they can all be sort of thought as IoT there. You, when you think about it, what, what does a typical IoT do in reality besides the, the silly, like, you know, is my, is my refrigerator going to kill me or my coffee pot going to strangle me? Or there's been ridiculous right. thoughts, you know, in the past that no, it's probably not going to, but, but. Can you start your car from your mobile app? Yeah, you can actually do that mm -hmm. today. Can you unlock your car from your mobile app? Yeah, you really can. So to me, the term Internet of Things has really just become this term that kind of means stuff that's connected. And really, that's almost everything now. When you think about you know, video games, for example, how those have changed. It used to be you had to have a console, and you set up the console and played, and that was great. Well, now it's like if you want to play it on your mobile and your PC for the same game, you probably can. And maybe your, your, your skin or your loadout or your profile or whatever you call it in that particular game follows you from your desktop to your mobile to your, and how does that work? Well, it's an API that talks to a back end that stores data that you authenticate against. Very much the same way that you would unlock your car door or whatever. The technology behind many of those things. Um, another example that comes to mind is uh, as a padlock I recently um, saw that you could unlock it from your mobile app or you, you could load your fingerprints uh, into your mobile app and then it would load that into your padlock so that when you got to the gym, you could just touch your locker to unlock it with your fingerprint and kind of manage in the same way through an API in your mobile app. So that type of connectivity is kind of one thing that I think of in the IoT space. There's a lot of other things. Um, I think some people also consider like home routers, home cameras, even your refrigerator and your whatever else, you know, those type of things that can be connected, they would be considered IoT as well. Um, do you think based on, you know, like I say, 10 years ago or more, you know, there was a certain vision of what IoT would be like at this point. Do you think we're 
kind of as connected and universal as we thought we would be? Um, and if not, what's been the impediment? And if so, what do you think has been the sort of net result of the sort of efficiency or interconnectivity of all this? Yeah, that's a great question. From my standpoint, anyway, I think we're every bit as connected as we want to be at this point because we're moving pretty fast as a society. When you think about the the learning curve, I mean, it's, it's we're basically moving faster than generationally we're learning in a lot of ways, right? So you think about kind of street smarts, you know, that's something that I think most people probably have, maybe not everybody, but, you know, maybe you don't walk in a dangerous part of the city at night. So you just kind of know that. How do you know that? Well, I don't know. I just know that. Right. But you don't have that same intuition when it comes to cyber. When we're traveling, we don't think, oh, I'm traveling. I better turn off my Bluetooth, and my Wi-Fi, and my mobile. Why would you do that? Well, there's some reasons why you might do that. It reduces your attack surface. And there's less things that your phone's going to be touching. It's only going to be touching LCD then instead of those other three or other two interfaces in that, in that point. So and I say all that just to say that we're moving pretty fast in technology, right? When you think about your parents and my parents and even younger people too, right? We don't all have a cybersecurity background. In fact, the majority of the world doesn't. So when it comes to deploying a network at home that's going to include a camera, uh, that if breached, could what? Well, lots of things could happen. Yeah. We can talk about that. But, you know, that's so anyway, to answer to, to, to before I jump in any of that, to answer your question, I do think that we've moved pretty fast in terms of technology. And in IoT, there's a lot of things to play now. Your car could drive itself. It doesn't in most cases yet. And the reason for that is legal, it's safety, it's security. And so I think there's a lot of good reasons why we have had to slow down the adoption in certain industries. Um, but the technology is there. Your car could set up an appointment with a mechanic. You know, I mean, all the sort of APIs and backends and things to do that type of stuff now is essentially available. It's just not being uh, fully realized quite yet for probably a lot of good reasons. I think we're catching up with you in terms of uh, security, both on the software, the network, and the human side. Well, I guess that sort of leaps into my next question. Obviously, nothing's completely safe, but in your opinion, has the security industry or IoT manufacturers in general kept up with uh, what you think are adequate potential security issues inherent in in IoT? Obviously, that's a hard thing to say across the board, but uh, do you think people are taking it seriously? Yeah, so I would say yes and no. Okay. So can we do things safely and securely in almost any domain? Generally speaking, yes. We sort of know how. There's generally the capability in almost every case to... You know, like you said, nothing's ever 100% secure, um, both in the physical and in the digital world. But do we know how to do things essentially properly? In, in most cases, we do. There's just not always effort. There's not always budget. There's not always maybe training. There's not always know-how. Uh, let, let me give you a couple examples to sort of make it more concrete. So when you think of things like there's something called Android Things, and it's a framework that Google's put out to help you create IoT devices based on a standardized framework. So if you're using sort of a best practice framework from like an Amazon or, a, or a Google or something like that to create your IoT widgets, whatever they are, whether they're little sensors in a drain field or a water you know, tank or it could be anything, right? I think you can do that right. I think there's I think there's technology and there's frameworks that essentially are available to make that relatively secure. So that's kind of the yes part. The no part is generally speaking, that's often not being done. Right, when you think about the average cheap Soho device from the East, right? You think about your cheap um, home router, your cheap camera, that type of thing. They're not that. They didn't use that primer. They're basically a cobbled together mess of code based on some old version of Linux. There's some PHP and some Python and some C and some, you know, bash scripts and Perl and everything kind of all cobbled together so that they end up vulnerable to common OWASP top 10 things like command injection. Um, if you read some of the blogs we have on the VDA website, we talk through some of the vulnerabilities that we've identified in widely deployed cameras, for example. Right. So I, I guess what that sounds like to me is whether it's just extreme penny pinching or or not, it seems like um, to do things security compliant requires some outlay of money that not everyone who is manufacturing things is willing to do. Is that right? That's right. Um, there's three things that come into play really when you think about security. There's essentially the budget part of it, which is, you know, are we willing to, you know, spend some money to follow an SDLC, to hire a security engineer, to conduct a third party pen test? You know, there, there is some budget associated with that. There's also knowledge gap, right? Like, do we even know what an SDL, 
is or why we should follow one. Um, would we even know how to interpret the results of a pen test? Um, do we even have people on staff that speak the right, you know, actual geographic language to talk to people that could help us and in that type of thing? There's a lot of sort of practical, cultural, and monetary things that definitely play into security. And then the biggest other thing that's unfortunately always at odds is convenience versus security. That's always at odds. There are almost always some trade-off where it's like, well, if we just didn't lock the car door ever, we wouldn't need a button that would unlock it, right? And that would be easier. It would be. That'd be easier, right, for you and yeah. me. Walk up to your car and get in. You wouldn't have to. You wouldn't have to put in a key to start it. Or, but then again, it'd be a lot less secure. Yeah, you're. Yeah, you're. You're going from to, to the in the wrong direction of the uh, the solution there. Yeah, and there's usually spectrums, right? There's kind of like the there's the left side, which is like ridiculously insecure. Nobody does that. And there's the you know sort of the right side, which is like you know you don't have a car because that would be more secure <laughs> than owning one. Well, okay, but then you need right. you know, There's got to be something in the middle, and there almost always is in every case. There's always a happy medium in every domain that's reasonable, that's in budget, that makes sense, that's easy enough for people to understand how to operate. But finding that middle sometimes takes a little bit of effort that if you're rushing something to market, maybe you're not willing to try to find that. So oh, um, let's sort of talk sensational for a moment. What's one of the most surprising IoT hacking success stories you've seen? Like what was the most surprising chain of events you saw from someone hacking a seemingly insignificant device and reaping huge rewards from it? Oh, gosh, there's been so many from, you know, sort of more personal things that we've seen in pen test engagements that I probably shouldn't mention, right, for client confidentiality and that type of thing. Sure. Um, there's also the more public things that you've heard about, like the Mariah botnet that took advantage of essentially, you know, open telnet port, logging in with known credentials. And so it was a very, like, is that a hack? If you just log in with known credentials, I guess that's a hack. You're, you're basically just logging in, and it's, uh, people call it a hack. It, and, but the thing that was interesting about that was the scale at which it took place. You know, they, they amassed this army all across the world. And then they could do what with that? Well, lots of things. You could make them all mine Bitcoin, or you could DOS you know, a, some target, or you could distribute malware or spam, or you essentially you know, have an army of drones at, at your disposal that you can then resell or monetize in some other way. So you know, one thing that's really interesting in the IoT space is scale. The fact that many of these things are online, so if you do find a vulnerability in a widely deployed camera or mobile or car or whatever it is, all of a sudden, in the physical world, you know, maybe I could only take one person's car if I wanted to steal their car. And maybe there's risk associated with that, too, both just personally and maybe the owner's going to see me doing it and club me or something. Like, I don't know. But if you're sitting on some island somewhere it's, and you could take over every type of a certain car, you know, a vendor or brand or something if you found a vulnerability, that would be wild, right? That would be a scale at which we haven't seen things. And so that's probably one of the things that we'll continue to see in the, in the IoT space is that if there is a breach bound in a watch or a phone or a camera or a group of glasses or whatever it may be, you know, look out for the scale impact of that, right? Okay, so I, I, I want to jump ahead to a question I had say for later, but so what are your thoughts on some of these sensational headlines that we see like, you know, hackers could hack your, you know, cardiac, your pacemaker or drive your car into a ditch or things like that. Do you think the sort of emotional pitch of these stories is actually helping readers be more secure or is it sort of, you know, appealing to the freak show side and should these, you know, are these things uh, this the scale that you know they make it look. Can you really like? Can a hacker really hack your pacemaker? Yeah, I think there's some value in kind of you know sort of the television shows that sensationalize some of the hacking events. Of course, it's not really that fast. That's one thing we always complain about as hackers, right? They're like on TV, they can you know he's like I'm bypassing triple firewalls from you know that is click 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 yeah yeah silly <laughs> statements that aren't true and just sound ridiculous for anyone in technology, but. But, you know, there's some value. Some of those shows have gotten better, right? They've started to get more consultants to make sure that they're actually using real pen test tools and that type of stuff. And so I think, you know, kind of that sort of essentially, you know, you're training the masses. If you've got some television show that has better tech writing behind it, you can actually teach people about some of the risks associated with, you know, poor passwords or IoT or, you know, whatever it might be, whatever the thing is, you know, talking about. So... There's some value in that, and likewise, when you're talking about sort of the medical in, in particular, right, talking about hacking somebody's uh, uh, pacemaker or... Or like a self-driving car or what have you. Fusion pumps was a big one that was mentioned. Yep. Uh, 
um, when you're at black net, for example, you could uh, dump somebody full of insulin if they're diabetic and sort of right. or something that sort of thing. Um, those in particular, I don't really think they were over sensationalized. They were actual vulnerabilities. They were demonstrated. Um, thank goodness that the researchers who found those vulnerabilities, you know, were white hats and reported them responsibly. And I think in the medical space in particular, it to me falls into kind of an IoT space, right? You think about some kind of machine at the bedside of a patient that uh, is connected, right, in some way or another that dispenses medication or, or receives or transmits data about their health in some way or something like that. If those go down, if they crash, if they conclude, if they have a vulnerability, you know, again, think about the scale. Like what if you could, you know, attack every patient laying at a certain type of bed by a manufacturer of a certain type? You know, I think there's really risk there. I think that uh, the researchers who have done some of that work have really tried to get these companies to do more and care more and spend more on security. And some of them have, and some of them have been kind of like, eh, you know, don't really see the problem with that. We don't think that anybody could really do that. Or so I think there's a need, you know, in general, it's kind of an off topic subject, but when you think about, for example, some of the car hacking data that came out a while back and made some headlines and things, you know, some people say, well, on one hand, that was really irresponsible because they didn't get the vendor appropriate time to patch. And other people say, on the other hand, if they hadn't, you know, brought it to the media, that particular vendor would have not fixed that maybe ever, or certainly not in a timely fashion like they did because you kind of put their feet to the fire, so to speak. So I think there's really a place for an appropriate and balanced place for re researchers to be able to publish these kind of researches and, and let people know what's going on. Because otherwise, I think people... I guess they just naively assume that all smart TVs are the same security wise. And that's just not a, that's not true. Just like it isn't for vehicles or anything else. Like some are more secure than others. And I think consumers would like to know which ones. Like wouldn't you spend, if you knew a TV was $800 and another one was 900, but you knew for sure the $900 one was more secure, yes. wouldn't you buy that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we absolutely. don't know how to know that. Nobody yeah. knows that. There's right. maybe a few people that know that. Maybe the pen testers, of, if you did both those companies as a pen test or something, maybe you would know. But generally, you wouldn't know that. Yeah. Now, you said something that sort of uh, intrigued me. You mentioned that certain of these uh, like TV shows, and I think you mentioned kind of like scripted dramas and stuff where they talk about like hacking could be used as an educational tool. Do you feel like there's any TV shows or movies that have come out recently that have sort of nailed the sort of hacking experience or the security experience? Or because I know, there, like I say, there's a lot of the flying fingers ones and the, you know, Pull, pull up and 3D rotate the body and stuff like that. But yeah, anyone really sort of stick the details well, you think? Um, to me, not really. Like, yeah. I think they all still, like the focus of any drama is on the drama. It's on the humans. And they're all sort of dark and scary or they're, you know, there's some love scenes or, you know what I mean? Like, it's right. not a real, like, that's not, you know, pen testers, we're doing a job, right? We're working with our customers. We're it takes days, weeks, you know, I mean, it's not like there's all this, you know, ridiculous TV drama happening every minute of every day. So, no, I would say that none of them have really captured the essence of, like, what, what it's really like to be a fan tester. But one that I think a lot of people do reference that has sort of better writing behind it, like Mr. Robot, is one that comes to mind. Some of the, some of the details when they, they pull up, like, you know, they'll show, like, a screenshot of Kelly Linux typing in some actual real commands that a fan tester might type in. So... There have been, you know, ones like that where I think they've, they've done a better job of at least when, when they do show tech details, they're realistic. Um, so speaking of pen testing, uh, on, your, on your website, on VDA Labs' website, a uh, writer named Michael Fowl wrote, uh, when considering when to, where to spend limited penetration testing resources, most organizations and penetration testing shops focus on the typical mix of uh, servers and workstations normally found in every organization. While this is a necessary area of focus, other things like that IoT device sitting at the edge of a network can be quite the playground for hackers that are willing to do a little reverse engineering. Uh, do you feel in general that this is a strategy that pen testers should be using more in the future? Should they be sort of spending more time examining the vulnerabilities at the edge of the network? Yeah, definitely. And I guess, you know, to um, try to expound on that, I mentioned earlier that unfortunately a lot of, you know, pen test shops, they're just, they don't do that good of a job, right? It's like you get one junior tester, he doesn't have a team or support, and then you thought you were hiring, you know, good company A, and you got, you know, junior person Z, and they give you a really bad pen test report. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but I think that this is one of them, right? They don't have, they haven't spent the time, they don't have a senior staff, they don't have a teamwork situation where they've gone through research and looked at IoT vulnerabilities where they know how to 
audit web apps properly, where they know how to, you know, abuse even maybe some certain cases where they have certain types of security in place, like multi-factor on, you know, we can sort of maybe trick that under certain circumstances if it wasn't pulled out right, or even though it's a highly recommended thing to do, so that's some shit. So anyway, yeah, I think that, you know, this, you know, knowing about IoT and kind of using that as one of the actual vectors. So hackers will basically, they'll find the thing that's really going to work, and that's kind of what you want your investors to do. You want them to look for not just run tool A, because tool A is widely understood. You want them to really kind of understand your code and your network and your devices and your exposure so that uh, you can, you know, be safer. Uh, so um, let's sort of look to sort of different sectors of, you know, society or whatever that use IoT devices. Uh, first, what policies do you think enterprises should be enacting in future to ensure that their IoT devices and other seemingly sort of innocuous parts of their network can be safer? So I guess IT shops in general or any any home user, or anybody who's doing anything with IoT, it's security 101 is kind of how I think about anything really. So does it update itself? No, why not? Well, just doesn't know that's that's too bad, right? So like when's the last time you've updated the firmware in your home router? Right. Never. Well, and it doesn't do it on its own. So that's vulnerable. So you know what I mean? That type of scenario is sort of a bad scenario. So it would be investigating products that maybe do. There are products that, you know, have kind of forward thought a little bit and they do update themselves and that's a good thing. So kind of making sure that you understand enough about the technology to know how to deploy it safely. Um, maybe segment it, you know, does that camera like let's say you run a big, I don't know, any kind of installation university or whatever it is like do the building controllers that control HVAC do they need to be on the privileged IT network where your domain controller is right? probably not they should probably be on a separate segment um, you know maybe and if they're if they need to be managed remotely which is kind of scary if they do it should be whitelisted to a certain IP and two factor off and things like that so really stuff that we've known about for 20 years in IT I call it security 101 that I would hope many businesses know about um, not all do. I would say kind of fifty-fifty on that, and it's even less likely that you know if you're if you're if the average home user is asked to do some advanced configuration, they may not know how to do that. So that's kind of a problem. And one of the solutions I guess we'll talk about it is having devices that sort of help you and give you some some assistance. Yeah. So uh, any anything specifically for individuals? It sounds like it's basically the same thing. You just need to sort of know what you're buying and what it what it can do in terms of like firmware updates and things like that. Are there any publications or anything that sort of critique IOT or, you know, home devices to let, let people know which ones are more secure than others? Um, I don't know if there's an exact list of that because there's so many devices out there right now that I don't know that there would be a secure configuration guide for everything, but trying to find it would be worthy, you know, so making sure that you have, you know, good encryption and authentication set up on your primary Wi-Fi router for your home user, uh, and so that your devices that are going to connect to that are also going to be secure. Maybe have the, you know, the SSID hidden, use a super long key. If you have to use pre-sharing key, there's other certificate-based ways that are even better. But, you know, it's sort of like knowing enough about how to set up uh, wireless in particular, because it seems like most of these devices are wireless, most of your camera and your doorbells and, you know, whatever smart grill or something like that. It's probably going to be wirelessly connected. You know, knowing how to set that up properly is, is good. Keeping them updated, keeping them patched, and uh, kind of reducing any unnecessary risk, um, I think it's good. For example, I went to a, a doctor, a small dentist office not long ago, and the, the dentist was kind of bragging. I heard him talking to one patient, like, my Wi-Fi is so strong, if, you know, I can access it from the next block over. And I'm thinking, why do you want that? It should be limited to like, just this office, right? Like, that's horrifying. Like, yeah. <laughs> so it's, I think that it shows that there's a real lack of understanding about what's impressive and what's not, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I ask this a lot of a lot of guests, uh, but if you had a magic gavel and were able to sort of enact a passel of legislation aimed at making... IoT or smart devices or, you know, what have you, more safe from hackers, what would you sort of propose as like a, a universal legislation, if any? Yeah, so there is something called um, CyberUL or industries.ul.com, cybersecurity, there's a URL that's kind of trying to bring some of the same standards to cyber and, and code that are in sort of like toasters, basically, kind of electrical safety standards, kind of the idea that my toaster shouldn't shock me. You know, there should be some basic electrical engineering body that's 
cre accredits you know those devices to make sure that they're essentially safe for home use. We don't really have that in any kind of code. You can write an app and publish it in an app store for anything. Essentially, there's no uh, there's no legislation that forces you to use a secure development lifecycle or an SDL, for example. So some basic legislation around yes, you should use SDL. Yes, you should train your developer. Yes, you should get a third party on it. Now, there's going to be a lot of hardship right with that, right? In the sense that, well, that's going to, you know, force maybe like small businesses to you know, make you know, the cost of it's going to be difficult for, you know, kind of entrepreneurs, or maybe it's difficult for, you know, kids to make an app on a game for mobile and my clients are going to structure to do that. Or, or maybe it's going to, you know, somebody gets claimed that they followed all that, but they didn't really get a very good test that's where they got, you know, they got the cheap one or something. So, I would say that nothing's ever going to be perfect in this space, but at least setting a standard that says this is what we generally expect out of these products. And these, just, if you're going to write code, it should be you should know about something about security. Um, I think that's healthy, not overdoing it. I wouldn't want to go heavy handed on any kind of legislation where the government's sort of, you know, in your books looking at every you know, line of code, or that would be ridiculous and it wouldn't get done well. And then it really would become, you know, obtrusive and expensive. But some lightweight process that's if not formally legislated, at least like consumers know that you didn't do this. You know what I mean? There's a stamp on your product. That's the yeah, some kind of a consumer bureau for certain yeah, standards or something. You chose not to do investing in security and AppSec, so I'm not going to Right. So what, uh, what do you think the future of IoT hacking is? Where are the hackers looking for next, and what do security people have to be sort of extra vigilant and monitoring going forward? Good questions. I think a lot of it... Um, again, it's scale, a lot of it's update, a lot of it's similar things in any other space, um, authentication, encryption, authorization, um, you know, situations where you install a mobile app on your phone um, for your car, for example. And it turns out that that mobile app doesn't have a vulnerability to the car itself, but the mobile app itself is insecure in a way that it would allow somebody to access data on your phone in another app or something like that. So you're sort of like weakening the security posture of your, like there's so many things that could go wrong from physical things to from the actual sort of physical device, you know, imagine the car side, if you will, or the, you know, the device side or, or more of the app side or the server side, the back end. I think we'll see problems and challenges kind of like we have throughout across the board, anything from big exposures of, you know, customer pie if the back end gets breached and, and imagine if for that padlock scenario, you're putting your fingerprint just so you can open your, your gym locker. And that saves you, I don't know, 10 seconds not having to put in the combination to your gym locker. Well, if you do that every day, you know, 10 seconds times five, you know, times your life, I guess that's significant time saving, makes your life more convenient. That's nice. But you're giving up something, your fingerprint, and if that back end were to get breached, then that stinks, right? Maybe a factor can now have that in it. Maybe your fingerprint's useful also for your front door or something else. That could be. So we see, um, I think we see a little bit of a lack of understanding kind of still across the board where people aren't sure that, you know, they might think, well, it's just a hack. You know what I mean? They have that mindset of like, well, I don't care if somebody were to hack my camera because it just looks at my front door. Right. Well, but it's also on your network. And you keep your books for your home business on your network. You know what I mean? Or whatever it is that's mm -hmm. probably more on your data and your network. And, and who knows what they could do with that outside of obviously sort of audio visual snooping, but you know, they could possibly use that as a launch point to then attack your neighbor or who knows, you know, what by you not caring about your privacy and security, because some people don't seem to. I've talked to people now like I do talk about privacy and security. That's weird. I don't understand that. Um, but okay. <laughs> you know, yeah, if, if yeah. not, you at least care about the security of others because your lackadaisical attitude could cause others to become breached and other data is sort of lost because of that and they use your access as a total. So I think people have more data and more important things to defend than they realize. And uh, until we kind of think through that a little bit more, I think that, you know, the types of things that we've seen, everything from, you know, personal attacks to more, you know, fraud, company exposures to who knows what other sort of physical damage can be done through IoT. I think it's kind of, as a society, we're sort of still exploring what are the real dangers and what is the real appropriate level of spending and that kind of stuff that it's at a reasonably safe level, knowing that, you know, you can trip downstairs and die tomorrow. Like, you know, we're never 100% secure, but we shouldn't be negative. 
All right. And on that note, I think uh, we will wrap it up. Uh, Dr. Jared DeMott, thank you for being with us today. No problem. Thank you. And thank you all for listening and watching. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more of them on our YouTube page. Just go to YouTube and type in InfoSec Institute to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Please visit InfoSecInstitute.com slash Cyberspeak for the full list of episodes. If you'd like to qualify for a free pair of headphones with a class sign-up, podcast listeners can go to InfoSecInstitute.com slash podcast to learn more about this offer. And if you'd like to try our free security IQ package, which includes phishing simulators you can use to fake fish and then educate your uh, colleagues in, and friends in the ways of security awareness, please visit infosecinstitute.com slash security IQ. Thanks once again to Dr. Jared DeMott, and thank you all again for watching and listening. We'll speak to you next week.